So before we get started, there are some misconceptions about audio interfaces as a whole that I want to address. See, I think many people, whenever they're getting started, think the audio interface and the microphone are kind of a package deal. That those two things together both combined make the tone that you get out of your microphone. And to some extent, that's true, but there's definitely some things that we need to clarify in that statement. Audio interfaces, which are really just a preamp and then an analog to digital and digital to analog converter, these days they aren't really designed to add that much character to your voice. Their job is to provide clean, quiet gain or power. So we're trying to boost the microphone to the proper signal without adding any noise and doing it evenly so that the entire microphone sounds even across all frequency spectrums. In other words, the microphone is the star of the show whenever it comes to the actual tone. The audio interface is the foundation to make sure all of that is possible without introducing any noise. Now, this hasn't always been true, and it isn't always true. A lot of old preamps that were being used before, you know, audio interfaces were even really a thing are using stuff like tubes. That is a completely analog way of controlling how to amplify your signal. It's gonna go through a board later, and it's gonna end up in a final mix, and it used to go to tape. But tubes in general do color your sound. They add a little bit more of a rich, low-end and mid-range response. It's often described as being a little bit sweeter. These preamps are coloring your signal. Signal. These preamps here are not coloring your signal. They're trying their best to remain what we call transparent. Unless it's something like a Universal Audio Apollo Twin, which actually has emulations of these old tube preamps built on board, most of these things are really trying not to color your signal. They're just trying to bring your microphone up to a proper level as efficiently and as quietly as possible. And whenever I say quiet, of course, we're talking about preamp noise, hiss, not the actual microphone itself. Why am I saying this in the first place? Well, if you're looking into this interface, the UM2, you're probably not that familiar with all this tech. And you should know when you're buying the UM2, you're buying a supporting role. It's not the defining feature of your sound. Your voice is the defining feature of your sound, followed by the microphone, followed by probably processing that you're going to be doing down the chain. So therefore, whenever I'm analyzing this interface as compared to analyzing a microphone, I'm going to be looking for different things. I'm going to be looking mostly for noise control, followed by preamp power and gain levels. And then third, probably build quality in that order of importance. Okay, so I have what might be one of the most decisive and controversial parts of this review, uh, at least for a lot of people, and that would be the use of an SM7 on this interface. Can it power it? So in order to test this, what I've done is I've set the preamp power to 100%, and then we're gonna hear a word from our sponsor, and you can hear for yourself how loud the hiss is. So this is actually really important to me, this sponsor, because uh, today's sponsor is DistroKid, and I wanna talk a little bit about publishing your work and the importance of it. Probably like many of you, I have a graveyard of forgotten projects and dead songs that will never see the light of day. And you know what? The video that started this whole entire channel could very have easily been one of those projects. It's not a good video. It <laughs> halfway through the video, the audio starts to distort and I just end the video. That was like, a, it's like an eight minute video, I think. That was a 14 minute video and I had to cut it off, but I published it. And in many ways, it's the catalyst and one of the main reasons I'm still doing what I'm doing and has given me all the opportunities that this channel has allowed me to pursue. So DistroKid is really all about that. Publishing your work. Absolutely the most important thing. DistroKid publishes to every single streaming service that you would think to want all in one place and you can do it all for 20 bucks a year crazy. And, and today we're going to talk about splits specifically, which is a feature in DistroKid where you can literally split the revenue income into different percentages. So if you're working in a band or maybe your podcast has more than four or five people on it. And on top of that, you can even set the privacy settings so people don't see what percentage of income the other person gets. So if you're working in a label or something like that, that might be helpful. DistroKid doesn't take a cut of this. DistroKid doesn't take a cut of anything. So check out DistroKid. You can actually use this link if you want to get a percentage off and support the channel. Anyways, I hope this was a helpful audio test and a convincing sponsorship. Back to the show. For fun, why don't we do the next voiceover test with a $1,200 mic? All right, let's have some fun here. Let's put some production behind this next section and we'll oscillate between fully produced and not produced. So if you aren't familiar, this is sort of Behringer's thing 
to craft highly affordable musical equipment at a quality level that should be much more attainable for most people. And I would be lying if I said they didn't usually succeed in this. In my experience, Behringer has a fairly consistent record of delivering on this promise, but not without some spicy drama to go along with it. See, in order to capitalize on this sort of marketing model that they have, it's not uncommon for Behringer to undercut their competition by blatantly reproducing the competitor's products at a lower price point. And that's at some small design changes like colorway and maybe a little bit of the form factor. And it can get even hairier than this. You know, in the past, Behringer has sued competitors and media outlets for criticizing their own products and their own company practices. Here's a quote from the CEO, Uli Behringer. It becomes insensitive when incorrect or defamatory statements are made by competitors and the media. While there is free speech, words do have consequences since we are all bound by the law. The rules should be applied equally to everyone. I would be lying if I said this didn't make me a little bit nervous what I'm doing right now. So I suppose now would be a good time to mention that these are all my own personal and fair opinions. So thankfully things seem to be getting a little bit better on this front and all this information has mostly been informed by Ben Jordan's video that I highly recommend that you go watch. He did a huge deep dive on this issue. He's been in contact with Behringer about these issues, including other issues I haven't touched on, and there seems to be progress being made. And to begin talking about the hardware, why don't we switch from the $1,200 microphone to the $100 SM57. So hardware is certainly a place where quality begins to dip, and that's pretty expected probably. It's $45 used to be $30, so I'm sure the margins are pretty thin. The most notable thing about the hardware beyond just all the plastic is definitely the knobs. They all turn at different levels of resistance and they also have different varying degrees of wobble whenever you move them. The case sits unevenly on its own legs, which means it's a little bit wobbly. And the circumstance that I have it on right now, it's making it a little bit more dramatic than it actually is. If I put it on the ground, It's pretty solid. Hard to pick up on camera whenever you put it on a flat surface. Let's keep it there for now. It's got one XLR TRS combo jack, meaning you can put both a quarter inch cable and then also an XLR cable into it. So that's any instrument that has an output cable for a quarter inch cable, which is the cable any electric guitar takes, and then any microphone cable. On top of that, you get one extra instrument input as well. On both of these inputs, you have basic clip monitoring to make sure you're not hitting too hot of a signal on the way in, and your direct monitor switch, which allows you to switch from your mix signal and your direct monitor signal. And actually on my unit, this button feels awesome. I've seen some other reviews where they say this is a little bit of a wobbly button, but it's super solid, probably the most solid thing on the interface. The only real feature I dislike a lot is the lack of true quarter inch outputs on the back of the interface. So that means the monitors that you're using, if they don't use an RCA input, which these have RCA outputs, then you can't use them. That means the amount of gear you're able to use on this interface is fairly constricted. You need something with an RCA input. Now, to be fair, if you're going to be using this interface, you're probably going to be using a small enough monitor that they're going to be using RCA cables in the first place. But still, you're limited in how you can upgrade in the future if you're gonna do that. Right, so let's talk about the actual sound characteristics of this interface, all the things that are going to help you get a hopefully better audio signal, not just the hardware, not just the history of the company, not just an introduction to audio interfaces in the first place. And to do this, we're going to be using the uh, heavy hitter of all the microphones on this review, the SM7. This is quite impressive, actually. This is a very quiet preamp. I do have it kicked to about 100% level and I'll be quiet so you can hear how that sounds. That's really quiet. That actually might be quieter than my Scarlet. And then we are peaking at around negative 12, which is absolutely fine. I've done a whole video on this. You don't need to get up to negative six dB uh, full scale, which is what a lot of people think you need to do. You can just do some processing, EQ, compression, gate. It's gonna sound way better anyways. You don't need a cloud lifter. I did a whole video on that. So I'm sitting here editing the video and I am noticing that although I said in the beginning of the video that most interfaces are designed to be transparent anyways and, and it shouldn't really affect the sound very much, the Behringer is noticeably kind of a dark tone. It doesn't have a lot of bright transient response in the high end. Something to keep in mind, I don't know what's doing it, but it is making the mic darker than it would be normally. 
goodbye. Anyways, these preamps are surprisingly quiet. For $45, this is pretty nice. Let's get into the actual specs, yeah? I think one thing to take into account though is this interface is not gonna be capable of recording at 24 bit. Now, because this is a beginner interface, I'm sure I need to probably explain what that means. Bit rate is actually dynamic range, or essentially how loud you can get without clipping. It's the range in between your quietest possible signal and your loudest possible signal before you begin to distort. 24 bit, bit means binary digit, means that your computer can start to code that audio signal at a finer digital resolution. Now you do have 48 kilohertz sample rate, which is a uh, uh, really, just fine. You don't need to do any level of streaming audio past that. I'm one of these people that really does not believe in 96 kilohertz or anything above that, especially if you're using an older computer. You can't really hear a difference <laughs> if you're a regular human being. Now, in terms of sheer output levels, how loud this thing can make your headphones or your speakers, it's said to reproduce 100 dBA. This is not true. Our friend Julian Krauss actually tested this and in, actually the components inside of the audio interface are only tested at 89 dBA as their maximum volume output, still plenty. The actual preamp noise is surprisingly good. It is a quiet interface. It might be built a little bit <laughs> cheaply. It might be wobbly. The knobs aren't gonna stay there forever. But the actual quality that you're getting from this interface, as I've said before with Behringer products, is good. So would I recommend this thing in terms of being a $45 interface that you could use on a budget? Hell yeah, I would. This thing is really a great option if you just need something that's a little bit more accessible and affordable. You're going to get really quite nice audio quality. Maybe the only weaknesses being the fact that you can't record at 24-bit. 16-bit is still gonna be just fine though. It also probably isn't gonna last forever. So let's have some fun to kind of end it here. Let's do a blind test of the noise floor response between my Scarlett 18i20 uh, and this Behringer UM2. So what we'll do is we'll record an acoustic guitar. We'll do it with the Lewitt 440 a condenser, and then the SM7B, a dynamic, and then we will hear the preamp levels of both. Is this actually a quiet interface when you compare it to kind of the next level up, or is it noisy and I'm hearing wrong? Let's do it. All right, guys, hope that was helpful. Hope you found it interesting. This is an awesome tool. If you need to make a $150 studio, get some headphones, get a used SM57, get this thing, you're good to go. You can make some really good audio with that alone. If you'd like, you can follow me on Instagram here. You can work on a project by emailing me here. Um, goodbye. <laughs>